Hi everyone, it's uh, Martin Shkreli here. It's uh, August 13th, middle of the summer, or really towards the end of the summer. Um, pleasure to be with you. It's uh, episode 17, uh, Back to Business. As you all know, I've been um, preoccupied the last few um, weeks, but uh, I'm sort of back and being as effective as uh, and efficient as I ever have been. So um, there's some nuclear war threats um, and some U.S. Uh, civil unrest. I'm sure you all saw the, the protests and the news. Um, the market was down pretty much across the board. I added the uh, Shanghai. I'm sorry. I added the Korean index, so you can kind of see how the Kospi is what, what that's called. The Kospi reacted. The Kospi is still up 15% this year. Um, Korean stocks were kind of kicking butt for a while there, and now they're um, predictably, you know, as you can imagine, uh, falling on the, the threat of an unstable North Korea, or even more unstable North Korea. So it's, um, it's kind of interesting. Um, again, uh, I don't, I'm not sure if the markets will react to the U.S. civil unrest, but I definitely don't think it's healthy that Trump is, uh, um, I think, increasingly being seen as a, a poor choice of president. Um, by the markets. Um, pundits uh, don't matter too much, but the markets are, are, I think, starting to distrust Trump a little bit. Um, we'll see if he can turn that around. Good luck to him. Um, my portfolio was up last week. Again, you know, a lot of people uh, don't short out there. I think shorting is a great way to reduce your volatility and to reduce your exposure to potentially, you know, a new bear market could be starting, a new war could be starting, all of these things. and. Having some shorts is never a bad idea. Um, so pulled ahead of the S and P, even though um, we've only been at this for 17 weeks. I want to say about three, four weeks have passed. Um, maybe a little less than that. 28 weeks have passed in the uh, in the uh, yeah no more like 30, 32 weeks have passed in the year. So I've had. Um, still beating the market and then finally for once and then also market neutral and also sub uh, sub 50% gross exposure. So really um, having a great time here investing over the last uh, few months. Um, it is kind of interesting that some of the global markets are now close to flat for the year. Um, you know, the US is not the only market. The German market, the Japanese market, the Chinese market are all pretty close to no return. Um, and not, you know, a couple days away, a couple bad days away from a negative return. So that's kind of interesting. Um, the dollar fell again. So the dollar is now kind of, I don't think it can be ignored that the dollar is, has fallen pretty substantially, which I think is Trump's plan, which, which has helped. So, um, you know, that, that's kind of interesting. Bitcoin is on kind of this unbelievable tear. Um, these numbers don't even reflect kind of the most recent numbers where I think Bitcoin has pierced the $4,000 number. And I, I think Bitcoin will keep going to um, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten thousand dollars $10,000 uh, of Bitcoin. So we'll see how that goes. Um, seeing definitely some weakness in the high beta sectors that I follow or invest in closely. Um, again, you know, when the tide washes out, you can see who's swimming naked, as they say. Not much going on in bonds, but I, I, I did notice the VIX, which I've added here. The VIX has jumped from 10 to 15, which is kind of interesting. Um, the VIX was kind of without a pulse. There was no volatility, so we certainly don't want to hear about nuclear war or U.S. civil unrest. Um, but, you know, we're kind of back to more normal pattern. We're kind of abnormally quiet for a long time, so there's that. Um, Anyway, just thought I'd give you two cents on, on that. Earnings season's pretty much over, so we get to go back to work looking at good stocks and not worrying about uh, quarterly results. But Snap, um, I think I'm going to cover Snapchat. I thought the results weren't that bad, actually. And if you look at the products, or leading indicators for revenue, um, with the new Maps product they have, um, I actually think that's sort of neat. And again, when you have Facebook and Google copying you, you're doing something right. So I wonder if Snap is, is kind of being, the baby's being thrown out with the bathwater. Uh, maybe that doesn't make sense. Uh, just the baby's being thrown out. <laughs> so I think I'm going to cover Snap 
we'll see what happens there. Um, there are a bunch of big companies that have late earnings reportings like Valiant, Novo Nordisk, Priceline. They're all pretty much in line. There's some software companies that have an off-month reporting, so we'll, we'll get those in the next few weeks. Mylan had a pretty bad quarter, um, um, which, you know, I don't know what to say. Generics in general are, are going through this Armageddon period, so we'll, we'll sort of see kind of what happens there. Um, so I thought I'd do uh, another reminder of hemophilia, because I made some changes to the portfolio, which you'll see in a second. But um, I really can't stress enough as I look across the medical landscape, the one, you know, sort of huge change I see coming, and hemophilia drugs are only, well, I don't know, 2 or 3% of all medicines by revenue. But um, this is really going to be a, a huge, huge change, and I, I think you should be um, you should be profiting from it. Many of you already have, but I, I really can't underestimate, um, can't understate how I haven't seen something like this maybe since Vertex came out with their cystic fibrosis drug or maybe since Hep C. Um, the hemophilia market's just going to totally, totally turn on its head. Um, so for anyone who doesn't know what hemophilia is, it's a bleeding disorder where the patient can't, uh, can't control bleeding. So it's inherited disease, it's X-linked, so it generally occurs only in men. It can occur spontaneously in women, but in general, it's a male disease because it's X-linked. And basically, these endogenous clotting factors, which form the clotting and thrombosis cascade, bleeding, clotting, thrombosis, or so are sort of in this, this big complex cascade that has, I wanna say dozens, maybe dozens of different proteins in them. So lots of places to to create uh, illness um, if you had any kind of um, issue um, with one of those proteins. So patients who have hemophilia A, which is most patients, um, are patients who are missing or can't make factor eight. Um, and hemophilia B patients, um, or about 15% of the patients of he who have hemophilia are pretty rare uh, and they're missing factor nine. And there's actually other kinds of hemophilia and I won't go through those, but these are the two big ones. And what's interesting is these have been big biotech products for a long time. And, and if you know the history of biotech, um, and if you've been in the sector for maybe two decades or so, what you um, still probably don't appreciate is just how large these revenues have been. Um, because the companies that make these drugs aren't really the ones that Wall Street really cares about. So um, Shire bought Bexalta um, Wall Street cares about Shire, but Bexalta was part of Baxter, and, and Baxter had was such a big and diverse company that people didn't really pay too much attention to hemophilia. They did, but Baxter was kind of a pharma company, kind of a device company, and they finally spun off Bexalta, and they finally merged Bexalta with Shire. This has gotten a little bit more visibility. Um, BioVeritive is a spinoff from Bio, uh, Biogen, which is its own pure play company. Um, I should just go back and say Shire is the biggest hemophilia player. They have $3 billion dollars in um, hemophilia revenue. Um, so BioVeritive is a uh, um, spin-off of Biogen. They have two brand new hemophilia drugs uh, that are recombinant factor eight and recombinant factor nine. Recombinants are just proteins made through some biological process. And then Bayer, Pfizer, and Novo Nordisk all have big products. So what's kind of interesting is these are all been like kind of hidden franchises. It's not like EPO or, or Nupo or say um, Herceptin or something like that that people have had a lot of visibility on because at the end of the day, Bayer, Pfizer, they're such big companies that they're not big products for those companies. And then Novo Nordisk is really an insulin company. So their hemophilia products aren't that important to them either. Um, so it's just sort of been this sort of um, really quiet and not looked at space because it's been embedded in big pharma. And now we see that actually that's changed a little bit because you have Shire and BioVeritive which are, which are very focused on hemophilia. And it is a big space. It's about a $10 billion, eight to $10 billion space. So anyway, patients who can't control their bleeding, what they, they end up having tons of different issues. So these patients have to take factor uh, eight and factor nine several times per week. So um, they have to do a self infusion. It's not a, it's not a subcutaneous shot. It's actually an infusion. Um, you can imagine doing a self infusion three times a week. It's pretty, pretty brutal. And if you forget to do it, you could have a spontaneous bleed, which results in hospitalization, um, maybe even death, um, usually not. Um, but it's definitely not a, not a disease that's um, easy to manage as a patient. And so what are we going to do about it? Well, the great innovation of biotech, I think that 
um, the industry can be, like I said, like hepatitis C with, with the Savaldi um, and other medicines, or maybe Vertex with cystic fibrosis, the industry can be maybe the most proud of what's happening now with hemophilia, where these, this disease is, looks like it's actually going to be cured. And like I said, I, I use the cure word very, 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 very rarely, because cure is um, not usually what the pharmaceutical industry does. Um, and that's not because um, it's on purpose, the pharmaceutical industry does the best it can, but it's hard to cure diseases because um, there aren't really any technology that exists that allow you to permanently change um, a disease process. So like I said, in, in the old, old way of treating hemophilia, um, if you're missing factor eight, you can just take a factor eight replacement, but you have to do it by IV, you have to do it three times a week, it's a real pain in the neck. Um, and when you stop taking the factor eight, well, you don't have any more factor eight because your body can't make it. So, so it's a pretty bad scenario if, if you know, you can't cure this illness because you just have to keep taking it. And there have been a lot of attempts to kind of make like a depot version of factor eight that just like it releases over many weeks or something like that. And those have failed. But, um, you know, it would be nice if you could actually cure the disease. So enter these companies, um, which I'm long every single one now. I bought Biomarin. Um, stock, which you'll see. Um, so this is Spark, Unicure, Biomarin, and Sangamol are all making um, hemophilia cures, and we'll talk about what that is exactly in a second. And I'm short, I just shorted BioVeritative, which like I said, is a pure play company that makes just factor eight and factor nine. They don't have any of the gene therapy um, products. So gene therapy is what's, is what's happening here. These four companies are all doing gene therapy um, and there's another drug called emicizumab from Roche, which, which actually also is going to hurt all the legacy factor eight and factor nine companies. So in many ways, the, the companies that, that make money on factor eight and factor nine um, are going to have big problems in the next five or 10 years because um, nobody's going to use these products anymore. Um, and nobody wants to use these products anymore. They're very inconvenient. They're very frustrating. And... Um, you know, uh, um, I think that it's sort of like, like I don't know, dial-up versus uh, broadband or something. But, you know, in essence, there's a huge sea change that, again, you rarely see in medicine. Um, so what is gene therapy, somebody asked in the chat? Well, gene therapy, traditionally, I've always been skeptical of gene therapy. The idea of gene therapy is that you load a virus. Um, you load some kind of virus, and you call that a viral vector. And you load it with um, a transgene. So I don't have my... I don't know, I don't have my uh, stylus with me, but I used to do these in the old streams, so we'll get a, we'll get a throwback. So you have, uh, and I'm the worst artist ever, so I'll do my best here. But um, you, you, you try to make a, you try to load a transgene, and so this is the, sometimes called the POI, or protein of interest. And, and so this is what you're missing, the patient is missing, so it could be something like factor, factor eight. And you take that transgene and you put it in something called a, a viral host or a viral vector. And a lot of people have been doing something called AAV. There's sort of two general approaches. There's AAV and there's lentivirus. And you can pick your poison, literally, I suppose, because these, these are real viruses. In fact, AAV infects a lot of people in, in the United States. And there's different serotypes, of course, of every virus. So each serotype terrible. Um, I should really get my stylus. Each serotype has a tropism. I didn't plan to go into this detail, but because you guys are curious, um, you know, I'll, I'll happily do it. Um, tropism is a, you know, sort of affinity for a tissue type. So there's certain, um, certain pretty interesting AAV serotypes or that are tropis or have tropism for, for different parts of the body. So you can have AAV say five, I know some of the guys like AAV5, you can do AAV9 for the brain, and that's one company I'm focused on called Avexis. So anyways, what's important to know about these, these viruses is that the AAVs are non-integrating. So basically what they do, they're non-integrating. They do not change the germline DNA. So they don't go in there and actually edit the DNA, and I actually think that's a good thing, um, because if you try to do that, you'd end up with with a host, uh, no pun intended, a host of problems. Um, 
So what instead what they do is they form these concatomeric concat uh, I hope that's spelled right concatomeric episomes, which which are not they're not even in the DNA, so to speak. They kind of form these weird um, the, the the AV will go into the cell. How it does that is its own that's its own can of worms. So here's the cell. So the AV sort of gets in there and I want to say in some cellular compartment, it's probably some ribosomal compartment, the epi, the um, concaromatic episome is formed, and what you end up having is read-through that reduce, that creates production of sort of this protein of interest that that will uh, get created. Um, and then all of a sudden, the patient can make factor um, factor eight. Now, in the in the actual germline DNA, the normal the the, the normal DNA is not being change so it's a sort of separate side DNA that's being created which is kind of interesting now in lentiviral um, gene therapy you actually have an integration um, and, and that's sort of I think more dangerous now with both of these you have something called a viral capsid that gets um, the viral capsid that, that gets stuck in the cell and that can become immunogenic and actually result in antibody destruction so you have to be very careful um, as to as to how you pick these things, and one of the things that you worry about with gene therapy is the long term, the long term viability of it. Um, the reason I never liked gene therapy is actually has to do with sort of uh, transgene efficiency or or transduction efficiency. And and in essence, what what happens here is no matter how many viral particles you give, you actually can't get every cell in the body. But one of the crazy things about the body is we have um, we have a liver. And the liver does a great job of getting all of the blood to flow to it through something called the portal vein. And because of that, and because of the way that liver cells called hepatocytes are organized, gene therapy transgenes get stuck in hepatocytes very easily. And it turns out, it turns out that hemophilia um, is a liver protein. So your, so your livers create the hemophilia protein. You can imagine that maybe your brain creates dopamine proteins and GABA proteins and things like that. Well, the liver creates hepatocytes. I'm sorry, the liver's hepatocytes create um, uh, factor eight and factor nine, which is why uh, gene therapy is particularly good, particularly good for. Um, for um, liver diseases like hemophilia. So in essence, that's how sort of gene therapy works. And I'll show you some results in a second. But in essence, these four companies are all making AAV vectors to change hemophilia. So if you, so again, just to wrap up here, if you, if you had this concatomeric episome that created the factor eight and factor nine, maybe it gets secreted and here you have factor eight swimming around. So I'll just call it F8. Swing so around and it sees a it sees a damaged blood, and it says, "Hey, I'm going to go clot that. I'm going to go help clot that and and restore order and don't let that bleed grow or continue to bleed." That's that's sort of what's going to happen if that concaromatic episome can get read through to actually create protein production, which which seems to happen. We'll show you that data in a second. Because don't don't forget, just because you get the virus to infect the cell doesn't mean you're going to actually get that protein to come out because um, the virus the virus affects the cell. Maybe the cell gets destroyed, not due to the virus. The virus is pretty harmless. It's actually maybe due to the immunogenicity um, that, that the body says, hey, I know you're, I know you, you're a virus. I'm going to, I see your capsid right here. I'm going to, I'm going to kill you. And, and that ends up eliminating the cell and you don't get the factor eight and you don't get the anti-hemophilia cure and you don't get the billions of dollars. Um, but, uh, and the very happy patients, of course. But the, um, so we'll see that about that in a second. But obviously you can also just make the recombinant factor eight. That's what these companies do. They create um, recombinant copies of factor eight. You take them by IV infusion. So you don't have to worry about this whole, you know, gene therapy nonsense. Now, the nice thing about the gene therapy is that this cell will persist and it'll keep making factor eight all the time. So you never, maybe hopefully never need to get a factor eight infusion again. So. That's the basics of gene therapy. That's the basics of hemophilia. Um, so my theory and my thesis is that gene therapy will eliminate the need for recombinant factor eight and nine, 
and these eight to ten billion dollar business will vanish and that from from these companies and it will go to these companies and maybe even more so you have um, interestingly Sangamo is is uh, they all have partnerships so um, Spark has a partnership with Pfizer and I think Sangamo has a partnership with Pfizer so Unicure and Biomarin don't have partners so in essence that's um, I'm not long Pfizer but it's important to know that these companies have a deal with Pfizer. So Pfizer's at least said, you know, I'm not going to let my lunch get eaten. I at least want to kind of, you know, partner up with one of these new hotshot companies and, and, and at least share the meal with them. Um, so anyway, um, this company that I'm on called Spark, they have a drug called 8011. This is for hemophilia A. They already have shown their hemophilia B data. That's what I said earlier was partnered with Pfizer. So Pfizer and, and uh, Spark have results showing amazing hemophilia B data already in humans showing complete reduction in bleeds. So they showed three patients uh, a week or two ago and the stock went up. So that's how, that's how high stakes this is. There are three patients they reported on. You would think the results of three patients wouldn't be that exciting. But uh, they had three patients and, and what they ended up showing was that, and if you follow this, this is five times 10 to the 11th viral particles per kilogram these patients had factor VIII normalized uh, levels of 11 to 14 percent, which is pretty good. And then they dosed one patient at twice that dose, and, and that patient they said had proportionally higher factor VIII levels. So it looks like Sparks first. You sometimes call this first in human, or uh, I don't know, first in human results um, looked pretty impressive. Um, they already have the hemophilia B data that also looks impressive, um, but so, so, so far, so good. Now I want to show you the Roche data. This is uh, emcizumab. So this is interesting. This is not a gene therapy. This is a really freaky drug. Um, I mentioned immunogenicity before. So basically what ends up happening is if you give these, these recombinant factors, you can, you can form this immunogenic response. I, I mentioned that word before. What that means is that you raise an immune response raise an immune response. So you form antibodies. And it turns out antibodies are really good. Uh, they're like homing missiles, right? They look like, look like this kind of, and they, 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 they can detect um, something that's foreign, a ze you know, a xenobiotic or a xenogen or whatever. And so when you give a recombinant factor eight, and maybe if you look really closely, it says the company's name and then they're like Biogen or Shire, um, if you zoom in on the molecular structure. And, and the body says, hey, I'm an antibody. I've been around the block. I know that you're not natural. I know that somebody made you in a factory. No matter how good the biotech industry um, gets at making proteins, it's the, the body still says, mm, I don't know, I don't trust you. Let me make an antibody to you and destroy you. So now if you're taking factor eight or factor nine or maybe even something like insulin, right? Maybe you take insulin this way your body eventually says no more. Now this doesn't happen with pills. This doesn't happen with small molecules because of the, the tertiary structure of antibody or of proteins results in these folds that antibodies can recognize. Antibodies can theoretically be raised to small molecules, but it's very hard and very unlikely. So in any event, um, there are patients with hemophilia A and hemophilia B that get treated by the, the classic recombinants and they end up getting antibodies. And these patients are really out of luck because the only saving grace when you have hemophilia are those fat recombinant factors. And, and so Roche developed this crazy drug, and I won't even explain how it works, but the way it works is, is extraordinary. It really is amazing. And so the patients who are the sickest are the hemophilia patients that can no longer tolerate the recombinant factors because basically they, they um, have antibodies to those factors. So if you give them more recombinant factors, they're just going to get into this immuno uh, um, sort of a hyperimmune state where they'll, they'll, they'll blow up like uh, me after petting my cat and they um, maybe even worse and, and they can't just tolerate these drugs and make them work. So in essence, um, emicizumab uh, does its magic and, and you can see this was published in the New England Journal a few months ago um, and you can see this 87% reduction in bleeding rate. Um, really incredible result. And so this is the Haven 1 study. The Haven 2 study worked as well. Now the Haven 3 study is going to be emicizumab without, without uh, in patients without uh, antibodies to their factors. So these are normal run-of-the-mill hemophilia patients. So if emicizumab works in those patients, all these companies are going to have a huge problem. 
right now it's just patients who can't tolerate these products, so it's not going to really affect them too much. But if emicizumab works, and I think it might work, in patients without antibodies, then you've got big problems. So, so I think bioveritative is going to be in a world of trouble one way or the other. Now, we looked at the Spark 811 data. It's hot off the presses. It's just three patients, so we'll see, we'll see how that works. But let's take a look at BMN270. This is Biomarin, a company I know very, very well. And this is one dose, which is sort of amazing. You get one dose of drug at uh, 6 times uh, 10 to the 13th. Now, keep in mind the Spark, they're starting to dose it at 5 times 10 to the 11th, then 1 times... 10 to the 12th, and I'm assuming it'll keep going up. Um, but the, this is the biomarin dosage at um, uh, 6 times 10 to the 13th. And you can see that the patients have no factor 8 whatsoever, because they have hemophilia. That makes sense. And you see the shaded region between uh, 50 and 150. That's normal. That's where you and I most likely are. And you give this drug one time, and all of a sudden, you can see that these patients stay in the normal range. I mean, that's sort of a miracle if you look at it. It's, it's a, truly an amazing feat where you have these patients who are sitting there previously bleeding. They would bleed to death without their factor eight. Some of them maybe can't tolerate factor eight. Some of them don't want to take it three times a week. So this is how many, how many injections would that have been? If it's 52, I don't need a calculator. This, these patients would have 150 IV infusions over a year, and so they get one shot, and and they're cured in essence. They never need another shot of factor eight again. And we don't know if this will last for years and years and years, but it certainly looks pretty good. Um, you know, we'll we'll have to see if they need a booster shot, or maybe they end up getting a um, an antibody response after a year, or after two years. But you would think if they're going to get an antibody response, they'd get an antibody response right away. So this is a really amazing, um, really, really amazing um, uh, outcome. Uh, now, it's only seven, seven or so patients, but, but Biomarin is, is rushing to a phase three that's going to enroll hundreds of patients. One of the things that I think about is, could you get a thrombotic state? So it's kind of funny. You have patients who can't clot at all. Are they going to become super clotters if they get up here? And that would be bad, too, because they would end up getting um, heart attacks and other thrombotic events, which which would be not a good thing to do. Now you could all, always take blood thinners and things like that, but all of a sudden you're kind of, um, you know, going back and forth in, in this huge sort of swing uh, in this case. So anyway, I made this bioveritative model. Um, I have the full model and um, I value the stock at $35. Um, the stock's trading at $58. They're only a hemophilia company. The only thing they've got are two hemophilia drugs. They did just buy a company called True North uh, for cold agglutinin disease, a very rare uh, hematological disorder, and um, it's a pretty compelling drug. It could be FDA approved rather quickly. It's going to be a drug. It's going to generate revenue. So when I say it's the only thing they have, I don't think that's totally right. Um, but you can see here that I, I expect a loctate and alprolix um, starting in about two years. I see that revenue basically disappearing as as the hemophilia market shifts. So that's why I'm short the stock. I think it's going to have major issues, um, and I don't think the True North drug uh, is going to save them. So that's sort of where I stand on bioveritative. <sighs> and um, I'll get to the portfolio changes I made in a it, but that's sort of the, I wouldn't call it a deep dive on hemophilia, but sort of a superficial, uh, a little more than, than normal dive. All right, so on Gilead, uh, this is the biggest investment I've got um, in, in the public equities. And um, basically, a lot of the times, um, I think people, um, one of the biggest mistakes people make in stocks is they think about the business qualitatively. And they say, oh, well, this is good, and this is bad, and therefore, you know, if I see more good than bad, I might buy the stock, and if I see more bad than good, um, I might uh, do the opposite. And, and that's a really stupid sort of way um, to, to sort of look at the markets because it's not about um, good or bad. And, I, and I've said this a million times. Um, if, if you had a, I don't know, let's see, let's have some fun here. If you had a bag, this is a bag um, of, I don't know, $1,000. You had 10 smackers in here, 10 Benjis, as we say from Brooklyn, 10 
10 sticks, 10 bills. I don't know, I'm getting all, getting back to my old Brooklyn style here. And uh, there's six of them. I might as well draw the last couple of bills here. And your friend Big rolls. He gives you this bag of cash. And, and you notice on the bag, it's got this nasty stain on it. You don't know what it is. And you say, ugh, Big rolls. Why would you give me this, this nasty bag with $1,000? Now, it's still worth $1,000. You might have gotten it from Big Rolls, and it might have a nasty stain on it, and uh, uh, it doesn't look so great, um, but it's still worth $1,000. Now, if Tiffany's gave you one of their you know, boxes, and it's a light blue box, isn't it? It's a light blue box, and it's got this nice pink trim, and it says Tiffany on it. And it's got um, just $100 in there. You know, sure, you know, you, you know, it's easy to say, um, and the $100 bill is crisp and clean, whereas Big Rolls is cash. You know, you see some weird residue on it. It's sometimes torn up. Um, you know, it's got some strange phone number on it. You don't know what's going on there. Um, you know, my point is, of course, that, that just because something looks good or, or things are getting better um, doesn't mean that the value is changing. Um, and the same thing applies here. It's a really pretty box, and it's got a brand name on it, but... You know, the, the box isn't worth $600. It's worth $100. Um, maybe it's worth $105 because it's got the Tiffany box and this thing's worth $995 because um, your friend, uh, your dubious friend gave it to you. But at the end of the day, and it's got this weird stain on it, at the end of the day, the, the, what you should be focused on is the value of the cash flow, not the, the sort of things that surround it. Um, so what's happening with Gilead is, is really big problems. So th their hepatitis C business is basically disappearing. Um, it was half their business in 2016. It's going to go to zero. Um, I assume it's going to go to zero. I'm fine with that. The HIV business is, is never going to grow again. It's so large that it, it really, they've got all the HIV patients, GSK, Merck, and Bristol have um, a couple, but um, a little bit of market share, but they've dominated HIV. It's really hard to grow from here. They don't have another business other than HIV and Hep C, and their pipeline sucks. So why would you buy a stock like this? It's sort of like this thing. Well, I would buy this bag. I want to buy it for $995, right? But would I buy it for, oh, I don't know, say $500? Sure. I would, I would, you know, have to go meet my friend Big Rolls in, in Brooklyn somewhere on a street corner and the bag would smell bad, and I don't know where this money came from, but for $500, I'm willing to take the risks. And I would not buy this Tiffany bag for $600. You know, I would, I would pay no more than maybe 105 for it. So the reason is Gilead's maybe the ugliest, it's got the ugliest so-called fundamentals that exist. The business is bad, it's not getting any better, it's gonna be bad for a very long time. Um, but it's still worth it. Um, why? Well, it's an $81 billion company right now. That's the enterprise value. And the 2018 earnings is about um, $14 billion or $15 billion. And that's earnings excluding R&D. So I like to adjust excluding R&D. And if you need some more evidence on why I think that's a good idea, you can watch some of my videos. But this is five times earnings. So um, really an incredible deal. This is almost a 20% yield. And I think I showed you earlier from just basic finance, you can't get a 20% yield anywhere. Um, it, the, the LIBOR is 1%, treasury bonds are 1% or 2%, corporate bonds are 3 to 4%, even the S&P 500, which is just equities, the earnings yield is 6%. So here you got almost a 20%, I don't know, this is like 17%, 17% earnings yield. Um, so really incredible. Basically all the business has to do is not shrink too fast, really, um, and then you'll be okay. What are the big risks? Why? How does this $14 billion drop? Now it's gonna drop, um, but it's not gonna drop to like 5 billion. It's gonna, it maybe drops to 10 billion or 12 billion. And, and the real issues here are, if there's an HIV cure, I actually think it'll be Gilead who makes it. So everyone who's doing research for a an an true HIV cure, um, really Gilead's in the forefront there. Now there, there's HIV vaccines out there, um, and uh, j and has got a vaccine, Merck's got a vaccine, a few other companies actually, and Gilead doesn't appear to have a vaccine. If a vaccine gets approved, I don't think that it'll eat into their current business. It'll actually prevent new patients from becoming HIV patients, which obviously would be a great thing for society. 
Um, so the, the real risk would be an HIV cure that doesn't come from Gilead, but I think that they're, they're really on top of that. Then there's a Merck drug that, that could be a big problem as well. Um, now notice that I'm not putting hep C as a risk because the hep C business is going to disappear. That's something we know. That's not a risk. Again, if you look at investments like this, maybe it's a risk to you, but you have to look at investments as to kind of what is the market, what would sur surprise the market. Hep C sales disappearing, it wouldn't surprise the market. In fact, that's an upside risk, I would say. It's a good thing. If hep C doesn't disappear at all, I'm assuming it's going to disappear. If it doesn't disappear, or if it disappears more slowly, then Gilead stock is even better. So keep that in mind. And I'm also being conservative with HIV. I said earlier that they have no more patients to get, that they have all of the, uh, the patients out there. Well, that's not totally true. They, they could have better pricing. They could have better global uh, access to patients. So they, they have this PrEP, which is a big... Uh, of you know, a big marketplace, um, this pr prophylactic uh, pre-exposure prophylaxis. So th there are some ways for HIV to grow. They have this big Tagrovir drug coming. So there's still some reasons to like that. Anyway, I just thought I'd sort of explain why, you know, an ugly duckling like Gilead can actually be worth quite a bit. So I think that, you know, in certain models, I have it worth about 120 billion, sometimes even worth as much as 150 billion. So, um, you know, we'll sort of see, um, where Gilead ends up. But I, I thought, you know, because it's the largest position in the portfolio that I'd explain it a little bit. Okay, so in a month like this, you know, shorts are, are sort of the place to be. Um, and you never know what month is gonna be good and what month is gonna be bad or what years even. Sometimes you have years, years and years and years where where there are no shorts or, or shorts are, are, are far and few between. And sometimes it's the opposite. Um, I have a friend who said, uh, one of my coworkers, he said, oh, everything on my screen is red today, and he's sort of new to the stock market. And I said, you know, I, I've been in a situation where that's every day for three years, from 2000 to 2012, I'm sorry, 2000, that would be a long time, 2000 to 2002, every single day, every stock was down, you know, one or 2%, and that was for three years until that abated. So, you know, we've been very coddled and used to this big success, but, um, you know, there will be uh, times when, when, uh, when that happens. Uh, we've had everything green for two or three years. So, you know, it takes a lot of, of, of patience to sort of, um, um, sort of survive markets like that. And I think that it makes sense to, to be market neutral even and have that discipline, even if, you know, your shorts uh, are really gonna punish you because the market's rising. When the market's falling, your shorts are, are there to save you. And this is a good example of the top biotech stocks I follow. There's two that went up a lot this month. Um, and uh, I can't make heads or tails of this one. Um, and quite frankly, the same with, with Fibrogen. But if you look at all these stocks, I mean, it's like shooting fish in a barrel to pick out these shorts. Now, I wasn't short any of these, and I feel really stupid, quite frankly, for not seeing the following stocks as shorts. I didn't short Myelin. I didn't short Teva. I didn't short Endo. These are all really, I wouldn't say easy, but um, these were pretty simple even say Malincrot and Valiant and Sun, these are pretty simple shorts to get. Um, you know, basically every generic company is telling you that it's Armageddon. The, the Mylan CEO even started um, her conference call by saying uh, the times are changing. Um, you know, usually these conference calls are pretty boring events. So when you need to to pull out the Bob Dylan lyrics to explain the current state of affairs in the business. Um, yeah, maybe I missed it because I was distracted. Um, very good point there. But, um, you know, this, is, this was sort of free money if you think about it. Um, in fact, there probably still are some stocks that are shorts that are free money. I mean, um, Endo, I'm not sure how they get out from under this crushing debt load. Now, um, you know, have to take a look at that further. I'm looking at their bond situation. Teva, oh boy, I don't know what to say about Teva, but... Um, you know, it's, it's sort of a terrible and nasty situation. So a lot of companies thought it was a good idea, including myself, quite frankly, to lever up and buy old specialty pharmaceutical or generic products, Valiant being the poster child of that. And um, now many of these companies are paying the price. Um, and, uh, you know, that's, that's sort of how bull markets end, to be frank. But uh, regardless, you know, thankfully, my businesses have survived and it's probably more a function of not being, not getting infinite capital uh, to borrow um, and there's some companies that have done okay with the strategy like Horizon and some others, but uh, 
you know, there are um, a lot of companies, Mylan, Valiant, that have to pay the price for, for leveraging up and buying businesses that they weren't sure were that great. So in any event, um, if you were short any of these stocks, we were short Neurotrope, and we had a secret short, uh, which we haven't talked about, which I don't think we're ever going to talk about, sadly, because it's already gone down so much. But we got two of those and none of the longs, so pretty good for this month so far. Anyway, I have some other current opinions. Uh, I moved Biomarin over here. Um, I'm continuing to work on more and more stocks. Um, feel free to ask me to look at some stocks. Let's look at the, the portfolio. It, it did exist. The problem with the secret short is we never got to short enough of it. So the secret short has dropped from like 10 to 6, I think. And I, we never really got to short too much because it's a hard to borrow small cap stock. Um, maybe we'll go over it as a, as a way to let, sort of learn, um, kind of learn what uh, how to short. It's a really good exercise in, in, in shorting. But um, it's secret because we wanted to... Um, I wanted to short millions and millions of dollars worth of the stock, but I didn't get the chance to. It fell too fast, and uh, it's uh, hard, a little hard to put on the borrow position. So, you know, so be it. But I made a little bit of money on it, at least. I mean, I'll, I'll take what you can get. All right, so here's the portfolio. The portfolio was up uh, 20 basis points. So another good week, especially given the market was down like one plus percent. When the market's down that much, you'll take any gain you can get. Um, I trimmed a lot, so I sold all the Bristol Myers and I sold all the Alexion. Bristol Myers has changed a lot. I, I'm not sure I fully understand it anymore. Uh, Alexion, I think I explained last week why I sold it all. Um, so you're down to only 43%, so that's for every $100 I have, I have $43 uh, dollars in the stock market, and only 8%. Um, is net, so only $8, $8 or long exposed. We're up 10.4% this year so far. And again, with only 40 cents on the dollar um, and only about a quarter or two, quarter and a half invested, I, I, these are some of the best results I've ever had. I don't know if they'll, they'll stay this way, but we'll see. Um, so you can see, like I said, Gilead is the biggest long, Regeneron's number two. Um, and then Avexis really sticks out as probably the riskiest and biggest long. These guys actually have an AAV um, drug as well, except it's for a rare disease, spinal muscular atrophy. I think this com company is one of the few companies that could actually go up, you know, 5x from here. Um, it's very, very risky, though. Uh, if, if anything bad happens, the company will disappear. So, so be very careful when you look at Avexis. It's, it's a very dangerous company. Um, then I have the three hemophilia companies. I have 2% each. I don't know which of these companies is going to win the race. Somebody's going to win the race. Um, Unicure was trading near cash when I bought it, so, um, you know, it, it was a great purchase. Um, I added Biomarin, only 1%. Um, Biomarin is sort of expensive. It's got a lot of other, other, other drugs in their portfolio. I know the company extremely well. The other drugs kind of help it, and they kind of hurt it. I think I'm going to end up buying more Biomarin, but I just, you know, thought I'd take my time with it. Uh, GSK is another large cap, so GSK, Gilead, and Regeneron are kind of my three large caps I like. I might buy more GSK. I think it's a really neat investment um, for lots of reasons. PTC, I've, um, it's, a, it's another um, spinal muscular atrophy play. I have to work on that a little bit. This is a new company. Uh, Innoviva is the name. It's uh, IMVA. It's a really neat um, company. They basically have royalties on GSK's um, asthma drugs. And I actually think this could be um, a 2x or a 3x. It's a billion and a half dollar company. They have a bit of debt, um, but the, the, the numbers just add up. And it's a royalty. It's basically just a royalty company. So it's kind of a neat little company. The rest of these stocks, um, we've talked about a lot before. Again, uh, AudioEye, this was a venture investment I made. And I'm selling um, uh, very slowly. <laughs> Omeros, I actually am going to start buying back again. I think it's pretty pretty exciting. Um, so we'll kind of see what happens there. Bitcoin, I, I kick myself every day because I uh, um, didn't get Coinbase, won't let me buy Bitcoin through Coinbase. So I'm kind of screwed on the Bitcoin. But in any event, um, that's that. On the short side, like I said, I added BioVerative. It's my second biggest short now. Um, you know, so I'm pretty excited about the BioVerative short. Um, you know, this, you know, when your whole portfolio is drugs that are going to disappear, that's sort of a big, big issue. 
Um, the secret short again was I didn't get much of an investment on, so it's not really worth talking about. Snapchat's dropped a lot. I do pay big borrow costs for Snapchat. I think I'm gonna cover Snapchat and move on. Um, so that's what the portfolio is at. So um, let's move forward. Some news, again, the myocardia uh, news, I, I don't know exactly what the heck these guys uh, are doing, but their data doesn't look that great for a billion dollar plus company. Uh, um, Zyne is this uh, company that had a weed uh, patch for epilepsy, Zynerba, and you can see that their results were not so good. Um, Fibrogen had this IPF data out. If the I, if um, if uh, that data really persists, this this could be a 10x as well. So I got to really think and look about whether or not you know Fibrogen is a real. Um, that data was real. But if, if it really is uh, gonna hold up, Fibrogen could be uh, an even bigger uh, upside than where it's at now. I, I remember that um, Roche bought Intermune for $8 billion, uh, and that was IPF data that wasn't very good, and that was a small molecule that had no IP. So keep that in mind. Uh, IPF is actually a bigger illness and a worse illness than many, many cancers. There are lots of patients with IPF and they die very, very frequently, very quickly. So IPF is, is a really terrible illness and this new uh, potential uh, drug for IPF is kind of kind of pretty pretty interesting. Uh, my friend uh, Vivek Ramaswamy raised a billion dollars from SoftBank for his drug company. I'm so proud of him. Uh, Vivek uh, supported a lot of my businesses in the old days to raise 1.1 billion, I think it was, for a biotech company. I think it's the biggest investment anyone's ever made in a biotech company, <laughs> at least in a venture biotech company. So really proud and hats off to Vivek. I, I hope he, him and his companies like Axon, uh, Axovant and others do really well. On the tech side, I have a few things to say. Uh, Disney uh, is dropping, um, so Vivek has a company called uh, Royvant and Royvant has a company called Axovant and Myovant and some other, some other vans, so uh, good for him. Um, so uh, Fibrogen is, is the company making the IPF drug, F-G-E-N, Fibrogen. So Disney is dropping Netflix. Uh, there's, there's a lot of, I think, uh, Benedict uh, from Andreessen Harwood said it best when he said, well, you know, you've got these, these companies that don't want to do business with Netflix, so it's like, almost like they should start their own company where they put all their content in a box and you pay every month for the box. And the joke is obviously he's talking about cable. So it's just sort of this merry-go-round of, of, of who's in charge, the content or, or the uh, content delivery. And nobody knows and you know we'll see how the Disney Netflix uh, insanity prevails, but it's definitely a weird situation. Benchmark sued uh, Travis Kalanick, the, the founder and CEO of Uber. Again, I kind of know what this feels like. Um, you know, there's sort of this, everyone wants to see the CEO fail, the, the cocky, founder CEO and um, sometimes when they fail you end up feeling bad for them uh, because uh, it's what is it kind of like Stockholm Syndrome or reverse Stockholm Syndrome I'm not too sure uh, where where now I feel terrible for, for Travis because at the end of the day he built a 60, 70, sort of 70 billion dollar um, company uh, very quickly I mean, it was one of the most amazing successes ever it's the largest uh, um, private company in the world. Uh, so, you know, I couldn't have done that much wrong, right? Um, it's, it's sort of uh, crazy how, how fast the world can turn on you. The Google um, uh, misogyny or diversity in the workplace email, um, I don't have a lot to say on this um, other than one or two quick things. The first is that I think Google did the right thing for their business. Um, they could have been quieter about getting rid of the guy um, the, uh, but I think they did the right thing for the business. Um, and that leads me to the, the second point I'm going to make, which is, uh, um, that, you know, in pharmaceuticals, one of the things I, I hate, um, about pharmaceuticals is how kind of slow moving and old the industry is. Um, it's a very traditional industry. The CEOs are not scientists by far and large. They're kind of lawyers and marketing people. Um, the CEOs are not founders almost always. Um, there's a handful of companies that buck that trend, but by far and large, they're not scientist founder CEOs. They're not coder CEOs like, like in tech. 
and you get this really stodgy old style business where you have to be a you know older white male almost to be a farmer CEO um, and I hated that about about the pharma industry I still hate that about the pharma industry I'm always gonna hate it about the pharma industry now um, for tech what you have is that you have basically the most liberal workplace that exists. And I think for Google, whether or not Sundar or, or Larry or Sergey or Eric, any of those guys, think that that employee should or shouldn't have been fired, they had to fire him. Because you have to play to your, um, you know, uh, you have to play to your audience. And if your audience is the most left-leaning employee base you could ever have, then you've got to play to your audience. And that's not what your audience wants to hear. And if it's going to make your employees and your customers and et cetera happier to see the guy fired than not fired, I'm really sorry for the guy, but, but that's what has to happen. And it's really sad because that's sort of what, what, you know, putting your principles ahead of your business can be very damaging. I'll, I'll give you an example of my business. I put my principles ahead of my business and, and it, it, it created a lot of issues. Um, you know, so, um, you know, it's just one of these things where you often have to, to fight that battle. And are you going to be true to yourself? Or are you going to be true to your business? And it's a really hard thing to balance. All right, some quick Q&As. Uh, my great rabbi friend asked how to fix Teva. And um, there's a legendary Israeli entrepreneur named uh, Mori Arkin or Moshe Arkin. Um, I don't know much about Israel, but I know enough to know that uh, Mr. Arkin is a very well-known entrepreneur there. And um, Arkin said that they should have seen this coming. And I think that that's really the best thing you can say about Teva. When you're the world's largest generic company and you basically borrow 40, your $40 billion generic company and you borrow another $40 billion to become an $80 billion generic company and you don't see the problems with the generics, I mean, I think, you know, it's sort of, you know, uh, they were asking for it. So I actually think Teva could, could even go bankrupt um, if you look at their debt and you look at kind of, you know, what, if, if generics get worse faster than they get better, um, you could have some serious issues. So how would I fix Teva? Oh Lord, I don't know. Um, you know, as, as some people, uh, as I think there was a movie where they once said um, uh, uh, a, a woman or a man wanted to see a, be a beautician and the person said, uh, I can fix your hair, but I'm not a magician. Um, you know, sometimes problems are so big that nobody can fix them. Does tax play a factor in your investing? This Mark was asking specifically about short-term versus uh, long-term uh, tax rates. Um, I don't think you should ever think about taxes with your investments unless literally, you know, you've got um, three days left in the year before you would get a, you know, a, uh, a a lower tax rate. You'd hold on to your position for three more days. That might make sense, but I think in general, if you try to do that, you end up kind of hurting yourself. Um, if you if you kind of play games with, with taxes. If you like a stock, keep the stock. If you don't like it anymore, sell the stock. That's sort of my, my opinion on, on what you do with taxes. Um, Mark asked about Omaros. I still like Omaros. I think I'm gonna buy it back. Robert asked about Valiant. I don't know, I have no idea um, uh, specifically. My rabbi friend asked again, why do I play video games? Um, is there anything that it helps me with? The, the true and honest answer is no. Um, I think video games are a terrible scourge. Uh, they're a huge time waster. They, they, they teach you next to nothing. Um, there are some video games that are so difficult that they teach you the value of patience and long-term planning, like how to get better at a complex game um, that is like, say, chess. It's got the complexity of chess. Um, you know, you, you have to, you can't just play your way to success. You have to think about it and plan your success. And, and business is a little, a little like that. I don't play video games that way. I, uh, I play to distract myself. I play to relax. Uh, they have some modest value there, but in general, I, I you know, they're, they're uh, a waste of time and a weakness for me. Better video games than um, heroin, I suppose. So that's my answer. Um, maybe Rabbi and I can talk about that offline. You could give me some advice. Um, Buffalo Wild Wings, Teddy sent me a model. Uh, he wants me to review it. I can do that for five minutes if you guys think that'd be fun. Leander asked about stock splits. Stock splits are kind of noise. Uh, whether a stock's got a big price or a small price doesn't really make a difference because the number of shares equalizes that. Uh, Chris asked me if I um, sold Alexian because it reverted to mean. 
Kind of, sort of. Um, and Chris asked about quant strategies. Now, I don't have any quant strategies. I have that sort of two sigma mean reversion uh, pair trading strategy. But the problem with quant strategies is that they're not available to most people because there's no quant platform that really exists. And Quantopian doesn't count in my eyes. So it'd be really neat if somebody made a new quant platform where you could actually test out quantitative strategies. And I actually have a few programmers working on that as we speak. So once there's a AWS as Amazon Web Services, if there's an AWS type of thing for quantitative investors, there'd be a really cool platform that you can test out automated um, trading strategies. Um, I think that that'd be a good business plan. So I'm working on that a little bit. So we'll kind of see if I can use that and then learn more about quant that way. I've been reading a lot of technical books. Uh, again, I'm knee deep in my software company. Um, I'm kind of splitting my time. I've got uh, a good team running the pharmaceutical company uh, that I own Turing. And then I have, um, I'm kind of running our, our tech company. So I'm doing um, um, sort of day to day on that, spending kind of 80% of my time on the tech company and 20% on pharma. And uh, my team is doing kind of the opposite. So we'll sort of see what happens. We're gonna go straight into the model in a second. Um, you can email me at martin at t-h-o-t-p-a-t-r-o-l.com. I am looking for um, some employees, so email me a resume. If you live in the New York City area, you're willing to relocate. We've got a nice handful of jobs, uh, especially those looking to do investments and M&A and other things like that, um, working with me side by side. Uh, these are high paying jobs. They're high stress, high, um, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, highly difficult, but high income, high potential jobs. Um, I don't have any specific, um, so not, nothing I'm specifically looking for in an ind individual. I know it kind of when I see it. Um, you can try my software out uh, at godell.systems. You have to sign up for a beta. It's not simple um, to do, um, but if you sign up and you get it, I think you'll enjoy it. Let's quickly look at this terrible, what's probably a terrible model. All right, Teddy, if that's your, even your real name. Um, the first thing I do here is you gotta move this stuff down a little bit. You always wanna leave a, a line or two up here. Uh, the second is, I, I guess, I'm not sure I can edit this model, but um, these should be formatted. Um, I don't need the decimal points. Let me, let me try to enable editing or something, I don't know. Okay, if I save it. Uh, or, Think, okay, now I can edit it. All right, so you want these to be no, no, um, you want to no, no decimals, they're not useful. The only decimal point you won't need it is for the stock price. Um, it doesn't help me to know that it's 1736.83. The market cap is 1.7 billion, that's enough. Um, again, lots of nits and that's here. The Calibri is a trash. Um, font, stick to Arial with uh, font point 10. Okay, let's look at this garbage model now. Again, leave a space here, leave a space here. Ooh. Leave a space here, leave a space here. Stick to Arial. I'll talk about the, the jobs in a second, getting back to it basically. I have a software company. If you want to work at the software company, you have to kind of go through a different channel. That's its own can of worms. We hire developers. You can we have developers open, full stack developers, um, you know, front end, uh, back end, data engineer. Uh, we have a bunch of jobs open for that. We even have head of sales job open, I believe. So there's a number of jobs at Godell. That Godell is its own thing um, where there are jobs available. This would be the jobs I'm looking for is more like an investment or M and A associate to work with me directly on potential new investments. So that's a, that's a totally separate gig. You might work on Godel a little bit. I, I don't know. Probably not. But anyway, that's something that, to think about. Uh, okay. Back to this garbage model. Okay. Again, with these margin numbers, I don't need two decimal places. I don't even need any. Gross margins or you know, you can see the margin changes without that. I don't know why you would stop forecasting the margins. It's sort of a stupid thing to do. It's not like you stop needing that. In fact, you probably need it more for the future quarters than the prior ones. Um, are you pretending 2018 doesn't exist? And we only have two quarters left of 2017. You might as well start forecasting 2018. Again, with these significant figures, I'm not sure that this 
gives you more information. It's just easier just to do it like that, see how much nicer that looks. Um, EBITDA is not something that we need to ever have as a separate line, um, just because of the way that works. Um, if, the, if the calendar quarters are the same as the, the quarter end, you know, again, they just add noise to the model. A big part of making models useful is making them readable, um, which this model does a terrible job of doing. They should be simple and clear, not, uh, again, with all this noise. Um, so this is already just a couple changes. It's a lot simpler to understand. Um, revenue growth, uh, Buffalo Wild Wings, again, I, I still want to know the future. I want to know all of uh, the next four or five quarters. Again, here in the, the full year suffers from a lot of the same things here. Let's see if you got the NPV correct, at least that's the most important part. Okay, you generally seem to do it right. Um, you have 100 million in net income. Let's see what Wall Street's thinking. That's roughly right. You have the company growing 3% a year, um, which I'm not really sure I understand. 5% is an awfully low discount rate for a restaurant. Restaurants are very risky. Um, the company is fairly valued according to your estimate, which seems about right. Everything seems about right. The big problem you have is that you, your, your, your main forecast is a 3% revenue growth, which you, you give me no reason to believe, no reason why there will be 3% revenue growth. I would fo focus on the number of restaurants they have. There, that should be in here somewhere. So you can't just say, oh, let me pick a number like 3% and and grow it year after year. That doesn't make a lot of sense. You, and I've given many lessons on, on, on revenue drivers. Even a simple driver like number of restaurants, rev per restaurant, multiply the two equals revenue. That's, that's all you have to do. Um, and, it, and it's a slightly more impressive model than that. So you have a bunch of issues with this model. I'd say on a scale of uh, A to um, F, I would give you a, um, let's see here. I would give you a D plus. Congratulations. Um, anyway, that's it for the, uh, that's it for uh, this week in investing. Thanks for joining me. Um, hope to give you another great episode next week. Any questions you've got, you got my email. Thanks a lot, guys. See you later.